Martita's is a special athlete. When she got into the sprint, she just liked it. She just excelled at the one, two, and the four. So that's where she's been. And as you know, the rest is kind of creating history. And then she's a, an amazing uh, student as well. So she's competing at a high level athletically and academically. And lucky for me, I was able to uh, find that extra lean at the end to go one, two, three, clock, clock, and clock. And as you know, that was the first time a family had gone one, two, three at an event. And I, I don't think anyone will ever do it again, the same family in the same event. You might not know, but 99% of the time, you need to know where your money is going, how much you're making, you know, know your worth, set your values, and, and go through all of that. But the bottom line is that women deserve and are going to get what's due to them, not because men get it, but because the opportunities are out there. So we need to benefit from them as well. Welcome back everyone to Track and Field Black History. Um, we are joined today by another amazing athlete, one of the uh, most prominent athletes the United States, the world has uh, had the opportunity to uh, come across in the sport of track and field and in so many other things um, that she's involved in. She's a two-time world indoor medalist in 800 meters. She's competed at four Olympic games between 1988 all the way to the year 2000. Um, while at the University of Tennessee, she was a multiple time NCAA champion. She was a multiple time USA champion. Um, she's also part of the USA Track and Field Hall of Fame and arguably the most consistent American 800 meter runner, uh, man or woman, um, you know, for over 20 years in the 800. So plethora of other, of other accolades to mention, uh, but we have the pleasure of speaking with Joetta today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anderson, for having me. My yeah. pleasure. Absolutely. So uh, we'll dive into a couple things. And uh, just before we dive into, you know, a couple things about your career, um, you're you're super active and engaged in various different initiatives. And, you know, you're, you're very active and you, know, you promote a lot online. And I'm, I'm just curious on what's been keeping you motivated and what's been keeping you going nowadays? Yes. Well, I thank you for saying that. I think what keeps me motivated is for me to continue to help others and be a better person. So with all that being said, it allows me to continue to um, put out good information, to uh, do my motivational speaking, and to still be involved in sports, not as the athlete, but as someone that's um, giving back to the athletes and to the sports community. Wonderful, wonderful. And we'll definitely dive into a lot of the things that you're doing uh, to give back to the sports community and to you know others in many ways. Um, but I do wanna dive back a little bit into your history and talk about what got you to where you're at today. Um, I'm curious what it was like for you growing up in New Jersey um, during the 60s and 70s, and what initially got you into track and field? Well, that's the story that I always share. My father I wanted his kids at the time. It was just my brother and uh, JJ and I, and uh, we would, uh, he would want us to run distance. He wanted to dispel the notion that Black Americans could not run distance. And lucky for me, we only ran two miles in, uh, back then. And so I would run distance runs and, and I was pretty good at it. He wanted, to, he wanted to teach us about discipline, focus, direction. And he thought that sprinting was a fast, easy way out because it didn't focus on the long, lonely runs and all of that stuff. So you can beg to differ, but that was his thought process being a, in the army. So that was his, his thought process. So back then you didn't talk back to your parents. So when he said, you're gonna run distance, my brother and I ran distance. But the biggest story here was that if parents get behind their kids and give their kids direction, they can excel in anything. Going you know, to Tiger Woods with golf, Venus and Serena with tennis, and we were before them, uh, we were doing distance. It wasn't a, a big sport as golf and tennis, but we were trailblazers in our uh, area of expertise, which was middle distance and distance runs. Nice. And I love that you're mentioning a lot of, you know, great athletes who competed, um, but in years after you, right? The, yes. um, the Tiger Woods and so many athletes who competed after you, you kind of set the, set the stage for what a lot of athletes are doing today. Um, and even now we see a lot of, you know, strong presence in the distance uh, for the United States um, in yes. track and field. Um, but can you dive into some of your role models? Uh, so you were, of course, speaking about your father, but who are some of your other role models that you looked up to, um, both as you got into the sport and as you mm -hmm. navigated through? Well, when I first thought with my two role models, which were my parents, my mother, Jetta Clark, and then my father, and that is not a story that 
or um, something that I take uh, lightly because I looked at them work hard coming through civil unrest, coming through um, the unease that we had in the 60s, the riots that were in the 60s, and them uh, wanting to make a better life with their kids and buy a home and being turned down because we were black and we couldn't move to white neighborhoods. And my father at that time wasn't Joe Clark Batman leaning on me. He was just a black man with two kids and a wife trying to find a, a better place and move from the urban area, which was burnt down from the 67 riots to another area. So uh, they were my biggest role models because they sacrificed so much for us. And they, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it a struggle uh, initially, but I, I would say it was a trying time, difficult time. And uh, they really worked hard. My mother had her own business in Newark and my father was at, at that time a school teacher when I was a kid. So watching them put everything into us socially, spiritually, financially, uh, athletically, academically, uh, they are my biggest role models. If you go to sports, I'm gonna have to look at some of the role models that I looked at were uh, Wilma Rudolph, obviously, uh, Manly Manny Mims was someone that I, that I looked uh, up to. Um, everyone looked at Jesse Owens uh, coming back from those uh, time periods. Those were some, some main names that I knew of when I was a kid. And I wanted to be like them, even Althea Gibson that was from New Jersey and Arthur Ashe, those two were amazing tennis players. Arthur, um, Althea Gibson also, uh, uh, not only did she win Wimbledon, but she was also an avid golfer. Uh, Milton Campbell was somebody else. So those, those are some of the names that, that I grew up around that were from um, this country. And then uh, I think if I went to other countries, you have, um, you know, um, Wilson kicked the her and um, you had, um, gosh, we had uh, uh, Alberto Juan Torino. Uh, we had people like that that were that I looked at um, as a kid back in the 70s. Uh, you know, Sebastian Cole was someone that I looked at when I was a younger person. But then when I got older, uh, I started being, being that person myself. So I'm no longer looking at them as role models, but they were people that I looked at. Even Francie LaRue, uh, Jan Merrill. Those were some names that I saw, uh, even Mary Decker to some extent, uh, being able to run with the European countries back then when it was Eastern Bloc, you know, East Germany, West German, you know, Czechoslovakia, Romania, it, it, it was the Eastern Bloc country. So now it's a little bit different landscape, but just watching some of those athletes be able to navigate and compete with them was something that I, that I aspired to do. Nice. That, that's amazing. And I, I think a lot of those role models definitely, you know, like you spoke about, had an influence on, you know, your career and what you've done. And then, of course, you've translated that to be a role model for so many. Um, I do just want to ask, because you were speaking about how, of course, your father, Joe Clark, um, yes. you know, was kind of idolized, of course, in the movie Lean On Me. But um, you mentioned that before, you know, this kind of, um, you know, what everyone knows him for, he was just a father, you know, growing up, um, trying to raise his kids. Can you talk yes. about how some of your experiences growing up then, how they, how you apply them to some of the things that you do now and how they helped you to navigate uh, through your life now? Well, my father was no nonsense and he was one of those guys that didn't want you to make excuses. He wanted to, to um, provide you the opportunities to succeed. So he did everything that he could. Um, his uh, ways were orthodox and a lot of the ways that that uh, that he implemented with his family uh, you wouldn't be able to do now um, but it was very stern and uh, no talk back no talking back um, would get behind us and support us all the time uh, went to a lot of my track meets um, wanted to make sure that we were exposed to not only sports but to culture mm -hmm. and I think that that was something that uh, was really important be able to understand and appreciate cultures being able to to talk about other things other than sports, about business, about uh, other countries, being able to have a different two languages. So it was really into that. And my mother was the same way, wanted us to have our own, our own business growing up in a time period when women were just coming around working on women equity, which we're still struggling with now. Um, but having a, your own business, being a black woman in the 60s, uh, that was something that, not, that didn't really happen. So she wanted to let me know that if that's what I wanted to do, it could happen because she was able to do it in a time period, which was more difficult than what I was going to have as I grew up. So that was some of the lessons that I learned and also learned not to give up. Um, you, you may not win, you may fall down, but if you fall down, get right back up. You know, they always say, if you fall down, look up because if you can look up, you can get up. So all of those things, um, and you don't have to do it by yourself, even though uh, my parents were really hard and stern, um, 
they wanted us to be able to come to them to talk through situations. We weren't gonna always get a yes, but they wanted us to be able to come to them to talk through how our track situations, our life situations. So basically that's what I learned from, from my mother and from my father. Nice, that's beautiful. Um, and touching upon one of the things you noted, um, you know, especially the, the 60s and the 70s, right, there weren't as many opportunities for girls and women. Um, but, you know, of course, we saw Title IX legislation come into play in, in the 1970s. Um, and we're, of course, this is the 50th anniversary of Title mm -hmm. IX. Um, but, so can you talk a little bit about Title IX and how it affected um, both your life as well as, you know, the life for many other girls and women in education and in sports? Yeah. That's a good question, and I'm going to give a shameless plug because I am on the cover of Sports Illustrated for Title IX along with some other amazing um, Title IX advocates, and um, I benefited directly from Title IX, uh, especially after my freshman year. Back then, it was the AIEWs and the NCAA, so men and women were separate. A full scholarship was different for men than it was for women. Um, there were so many uh, barriers, uh, but going, going before that, having the opportunity to have some of the sports that the men were having. And I think that it's important for us to realize that Title IX isn't about taking something from someone else so the women could benefit. Title IX is for making sure that there's equality. And we're not, we don't want to do these sports or these activities to get this money and be compensated because we, because the men are doing it or have the, those opportunities. We want this because it's the right thing and we uh, deserve it. So it's not uh, something that I take lightly. I was very instrumental in talking about it as a college student. And now as I travel, and even before now, when I spoke to my campus, um, I talked about Title IX. So they understood that the lacrosse, the soccer, the field hockey, the scholarships, the, even the salaries that coaches are starting to make, women coaches are starting to make now, that was not even an option back then. So uh, I think that it's important for us to continue to remind the younger people that, but they have to take up the reins and move forward because uh, this is a different time period. So the issues are different. You have NIL for, for kids now, you have um, different internships, you have paid things. So it's a whole different landscape, but the bottom line is that women deserve and are going to get what's due to them, not because men get it, but because it's and not that the opportunities are out there. So we need to benefit from them as well. Nice, right, beautiful. And yeah, you're, you're speaking about so many of the different things. I love you mentioned, um, you know, something that direct, directly impacted you while at Tennessee, right? You had the, um, the AIAW and, yes. and transferred into NCAA that provided um, an opportunity for women, but as you spoke about, even today, there's still a lot of setbacks and things like that, that, you yeah. know, still a lot of um, opportunities for women to achieve. What do you see as the future of, um, you know, equality for women and, you know, some of the things that we still can work towards? I think uh, in the future, what we will see is that salaries for coaches and administrators will go up. Um, you'll see uh, more women, women of color. Uh, you'll see uh, other ethnicities, uh, getting the, the jobs and the careers, uh, not because you're a woman, but because you're qualified. And I think long gone are that you say that uh, we have to give a woman a job. No, the women are qualified. And so uh, may maybe many years ago, you would put a woman in a position because you had to fill a quota, but that's not the case now. And so I think that what's gonna happen as we move forward is that because women have the education now, well, uh, we, we, we know how to coach, how to be administrators, how to, how to deal with finances, all those different careers that are in the sports industry, um, be the CEO of a group, be, be an athletic director, to be the director of, 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 of departments. So we are able to do that. And I think now what you're going to see is that now are we going to get those positions, we're going to be paid compensations. And, uh, and I think that'll be something great, but more importantly, I think that you'll see some of the younger girls wanting to stay in the sports industry uh, because it's a billion dollar industry. And there's so many things that you can do, uh, so many careers that are in this industry. And, and, and track and field is just, there are basketball as, a, as an athlete, that's good, but there's so many other different avenues that you can go down to be effective and, and to have a career in the sports industry. 
That's beautiful. And yeah, I, I love seeing, you know, there's so many women um, who are becoming coaches, who are becoming, uh, getting into these positions in the sports industry. Um, and like you said, you know, not only in some of the other sports, in track and field, whether it's basketball, even, you know, um, other sports as well. And it's really great to be able to see that progress. Um, yes. So can you talk about your time at Tennessee um, and also in the context of, um, you know, speaking of Title IX and speaking of some of the women that influenced you while you were at Tennessee? Well, that'd be my pleasure. When I went to Tennessee, it was the first time that I had a woman's coach because my coach was a male coach in, in, um, in high school. And when I went to, to the University of Tennessee, I chose that school uh, unbeknownst to, to me that uh, I was going to be at an institution that had women uh, that were in charge, women that were winning from my coach, Terry Crawford, to Pat Head Summit. The athletic director was Gloria Ray and followed by Joan Cronin. The sports uh, uh, information director was uh, Debbie Jennings. Um, I was able to see women in charge and women winning. And then our trainers uh, were, were women. And I, I thought that that was something that was really special. Didn't realize how special it was. I was a young kid, but it was different. But when I got older, I said, you know what? I want to be in the, in the sports world. As it evolved, hopefully I would be able to be in it and, and uh, watching them and seeing them move. Now, what I didn't see then were Black women in any of those positions. But for me at that time, I saw a woman and my Black woman was my mother. So remember, she was my role model. So seeing her with her own business, seeing her navigate through uh, rules and regulations, uh, and I, I could touch, feel, and hug her, I had the Black woman. I didn't have it in the sports world, um, but I had someone that I could talk to and she understood business. But when I saw the women that were not of color in the sports world, it was really interesting. I was like, well, I want to be one of the first ones that got involved. That was my was to kind of break the color barrier. So that was what I wanted to do as a, as a college student. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I, I love you know, what you're talking about where you, know, you had the representation from the women, but there was still that lack of re representation for Black women, you know, which still, um, there's, a, of course, a lot of progress, but it's good to see you know, more Black women getting opportunities and being well represented, especially in our sport. Yes. Uh, um, so right after, you know, a couple of years after Tennessee, you did make your first Olympic team in 1988. Right. Um, and if you can take me back to that race um, at the Olympic trials and kind of the yes. feeling that you experienced realizing you made your first Olympic team. Right. Well, I, I tried out uh, six times for the Olympics. My first time, I was a high schooler. Myself and Kim Gallagher made the finals, and we were racing against each other. Ended up taking seventh and eighth, and we fell short, but we did what I think maybe two, two or three in the finals, um, which was a pretty good time because I think we had gone two or one or so uh, the day or so before. Um, and then 1984, I did not make the team. I was in college, my senior year in college, even though I won the NCAAs. I was just too tired and could not compete uh, anymore at that level to make the team, just a little bit too tired. Made my first team in 1988, and that was in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I actually uh, made that team by the skin of my shoulder. I outleaned my competitor, which was Debbie uh, Grant at the time, who ended up being one of my best friends now. But at that time, she was not. And uh, she, so I out outleaned her for my first team. And I always say that it had they not given me the flag, because when you cross the finish line, they bring a little flag over to you. And when I crossed the line, I was just lying sprawled out on the track. I did not know had I taken third or fourth. I always say had I taken fourth, they would not have been able to hold the meet there because I wouldn't have gotten off of the track. So lucky for the meet that I, I to go on, I, I, I took third. They gave me the, the flag and I took a victory lap. And I had a score on my shoulder. My father was there. And, my high school coach was there and my brother was there. So that was a really cool experience and, and it got my feet wet. I, I didn't do well in 88. And that was really tough dealing with this, uh, the H the, the drugs, steroids and all of that stuff back then. Uh, it was really tough for me to run uh, 159 while they're running 154s, you know? So that was really tough. So um, that was my first experience, but it was amazing just to be part of opening ceremonies, to have my mother go to make the Olympic team. and 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 uh, to represent your country, uh, that's the dream come true. 
Nice. And, and of course, though, that was your first Olympics, that was not your last in any capacity you made, yes. um, you know, three other teams, you know, consecutively after that, uh, which is yes. unprecedented. Um, and not only that, but you competed across four different decades from the late seventies, all the way to 2000. Um, yes. What do you attribute that longevity, that ability to, you know, not only make these Olympic teams, but, you know, compete at the highest level for so long? But okay. well, thanks for asking that question. Um, yes, I did compete for a very long time, never uh, missed a season, uh, never out for injuries. Uh, I, I, I made seven world championship teams. The first, the first two I made were every four years, and then they went every two years. Had they been every two years, I would have made a lot more, but um, I, I did make seven world outdoor championship teams. And I think I attribute that to many things. One, just being given the body that can endure. Um, this this pavement, you know, we didn't have all these alternative training styles. We weren't swimming. We weren't particularly running on grass. We did a lot of LSD, long, slow distances, what we pretty much did then. And we didn't have the Ultra G. We didn't have all these fancy training methods and cool, cold tanks. And so, so I think my body was able to endure that training load, if you will, for over 25 years. And I think that is one thing I contribute uh, contribute my longevity to was was that I had um, a body that could endure. Then I had coaches that didn't really. Uh, I was born along slowly. I didn't just come in really fast and then disappear. Um, they brought me along slowly and slowly, slowly. I got better and better. So uh, even in high school, I did didn't really train that hard. I mean, we we didn't know what to really do with me. I, there was I was like something that was different, being able to run 203 in high school back then. But that being said, I think that um, the other thing was that my mindset, I had a very strong uh, mindset. I was very tough. I, 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 I didn't let things kind of get to me and distract me. And when I didn't do well, I, I, I was upset. But in time, I was able to navigate and figure stuff out. So I think that those are the three things that uh, gave me longevity where yeah. my, my body being able to endure, my coach is bringing me along slowly and then my mindset. That's amazing. And, you know, those are, those are a lot of things that, you know, take a lot of um, willpower, a lot of support on um, that you do need. And, you know, I, again, you're a testament to be able to <laughs> maintain such a high quality um, yeah. for so long. Um, but I am curious about your transition from college to professional, because um, wow. of course you had this very long, um, you know, professional career, but, thinking of your transition from college to professional and thinking about, did you receive support or education and more so in terms of things like um, financial literacy and you know working with agents and even just other aspects of being an yes. adult? Yes, well, that, that's a good question because you're talking about a time period when by and large women were not making much money at all. So it was just, we were just happy to get on the plane, have a charter flight to the next meet. Mm -hmm. And I was not running nearly as fast. You have to remember these girls now running 156, 157, but that would be like last place. So 154 was first, 154 was second, 155 was third, 155 was fourth. So you won 158, well, you're in the back of the pack. So I'm not really commanding any money anyway. And um, as, for, as far as ages were concerned, uh, I was a Nike athlete um, throughout my entire career, but um, I, I did have an agent that I was with out of college and then uh, my financial literacy, which is something I speak to kids about now, I just happened to know from my parents that you should invest, put money away. And then I, uh, it was a guy named Mike Connolly, who was one of the best uh, long jump, triple jumpers and gold medalists uh, out, out there. And uh, he always talked about money. So we would sit down and talk about investments. And back then it was a call, a called Oppenheimer Fund. So I remember specifically getting a mutual fund with that when I was 21, 22 years old and looking into that, he talked about that all the time. So we would get together, talk about that, talk about real estate. Um, he was really money oriented. So I liked hanging out with him and him picking my brain and I'm picking his brain and we come up with these things that we should do with our money. Um, wasn't much stock, stock market material at that age, but the fact that we were putting money away in, in mutual funds, which was really better than just putting in a savings account, even at that age. So that's pretty much where, and then I started studying the, the market and, and starting to understand it better. So I did not really have any guidance with that piece. Uh, I think now that the landscape is different. So 
they make a lot more money, have people that can help them. But there's a lot of people, kids still wasting, athletes still wasting money and uh, you have taxes that, you know, they have to deal with, you have agents that have to get the commission. They just don't know. And so I think that as, as you meander through uh, turning pro, the pro page is different than what it was in my time period. So I think that now you have to be informed. You have to have someone outside of your agent that's uh, that's on your side, even your coaches sometimes, because you know they want to get a piece of the pie for coaching you now and your bonus structure. All these things are, are, are really important. So long are gone are the times when you just put your head in the sand and let someone else navigate your funds. I think, and I know for a fact, you have to stay up on top of it. You may not know every little penny, but you need to know 99% of it. You made that 1%, you might not know, but 99% of the time you need to know where your money is going, how much you're making, you know, know your worth, set your values and, and go through all of that. So my transition from college to pro was simple because I, I wasn't making much money. I had, a, I had a little contract that Nike gave to me and had some little light bonuses. And, you know, I was back in, in grad school. So, it, you know, that was being taken care of. So it wasn't really, you know, I was doing it because I, I like to do it and I wanted to travel. And I did not know how I would run 154, 155 to be competitive. But in 1989, when the wall came down in East Germany, that changed everything because now you, you don't have the communism, communist countries anymore. Everything is divided up. So now those women that were running 154, they're now running 157. Well, guess what? That's what I run now. So uh, I think in 1998 or 1990, not 98, it might have been 98. I don't know what year it was, but I had one of my best seasons ever. Um, and uh, it was just for me being able to, to stay there, stay the course. So from 1992, even in the Olympic Games in Barcelona, I ran really well. Uh, I made the finals. Uh, we had the fastest semifinals ever. Uh, we, I think uh, fifth, sixth place was 158 low. Um, and we ran three days in a row. These girls now run one day, two day, they take a break off and they run again. We went one, two, three. So you start off at 59, you drop down to 58 and then you drop again. And so, uh, and that was with no, no rest in between. So my transition, like I said, from, from college to pro was seamless in that I just was going to Europe and made a little bit of something. But by and large, I was just over in Europe trying to run fast. And to get into meets. And to get to meets. Beautiful. That, that's beautiful. Um, and you were you're talking about kind of the landscape of the 800 meters, you know, over the you know multiple decades you competed with. Um, but just even thinking of you know uh, the U.S. women in the 800, you mentioned you know Madeline Manning before you. Um, yes. You mentioned Kim Gallagher, um, Debbie Grant, who you competed with. Yes. Um, and then even after you, right, your, um, you know, Alicia Montano, uh, yeah. Ajay Wilson, Raven Rogers, a thing Mo. Um, yeah. Just curious on your thoughts of the progression of the women's 800 over the past few decades with American runners. Well, I, I think it's progressed and everything in life is progressive. See, that's the key. You start off and you, and you ought to get better. Uh, and because the tracks are faster, training is better, spikes are this. So that's just a, a basic progression level. But I think that if you look at the consistency of, of the athletes in my time and before compared to what you have now in longevity, you don't normally see that. IJ has probably been around a little bit longer, but she's, she's you know, uh, no but, she is one of the older ones around um, now. And so when you see um, her still running at a high level, that's good, but then you have so many of the younger people still coming for her spot. So I think that, the, like I said, the landscape is different. But one thing that isn't different is that you have to continue to train, and you're not going to get away, get out of that. That's nice. Um, and so just before, because I do want to um, talk a little bit about, of course, your daughter and what she's doing now. But just to kind of cap off the 800, of course, you and your yes. your sisters were, you know, kind of a dynasty in the 800 from the time you started all the way to your sister Hazel. Hazel. Um, and so curious, can you talk to me about that in terms of like the support you all gave each other and even wow. at 2000, you know, <laughs> making the Olympic team um, kind of as a trio? That was a difficult time because when my sister is 15 years younger than me and so she started getting good, you know, after college, my sister-in-law was running that the 400 was really great at that. 
my brother decided to put her in the 800 to give her a little bit more longevity. Of course, I thought it was already crowded enough with um, Amanda Rainey, we had Mutola and the Kuro. And in, the, in this country, we had Rainey, Favor, um, oh geez, I can't remember all the Debbie Grant. Um, I can't remember, unfortunately, I can't, all these different names are Alicia, Alicia Harvey. So we had enough people, I thought, Regina Jacobs in, in, in the 800. So why are you bringing in my sister-in-law? And then my sister's getting good. So that was difficult. Then I had a car accident in 1999. That was very, uh, 1998 in, uh, in September. And I was bedridden for, for three months. And then I finally got up in December. And then that is when I started training again. And 99 was a rough season for me. I, I did it trying to tell my body that I was gonna be able to, 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 to run again, to be at that level. So I, I, I didn't win some races. I was running 204, 203s. Then I got down to 201. But my point is that um, having them in the race, it was in, in my race, initially it wasn't fun at all. It was quite frustrating, especially when my sister-in-law came to my event. And I think her second time, she got the American record. And then having me having to train with them after my car accident, knowing that I'm not the same person, knowing what workouts that I should do, knowing what they're doing, seeing it every day and knowing I'm, I'm not really there yet. But I told you one of my greatest assets was my mind. So I was able to, to talk my way in things and, 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 and run smarter. So I, I would run a different type of race. I would kind of be in the back more now or either maybe more in the front at times. depends, but I didn't want a lot of contact because if I did that, because I ripped my obliques. So had I tore my obliques, so had I gotten pushed, it would, it would hurt. So I would sometimes have to stop. So I need to make sure I stayed away from pushing and jostling because I didn't want to stop, especially at the Olympic trials. And um, it, we became a support system. And then we realized that, wait, we might be able to go one, two, three. It's going to be tough to do. We got Mediterranean in there. We have a couple of other people that are in that race. It's going to be a tough, especially I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent physically, mentally. I'm telling my body it can do it, but I, I know what I should, what workouts I should do and that I'm not able to do. So for me to make that team, I was definitely the weaker link out of all of them. Gerald had made the team in the 400 earlier on. So she still has some life in the lake, but she's a little bit tired. Hazel was kind of really fresh out of all of us. So I, I, I looked at how she was navigating through the rounds quite easily. Gerald kind of got through the rounds a little easy, but she was so winded from, she, I think she had run 49 seconds and she had already run three or four, four hundreds and then had maybe two days off and came back again. And then you have me who got through the rounds smart. You know, I was, you know, I would win my heat, but I would slow the race down, had a really big kick. So I knew in the finals, you know, I'd have to position myself and rely on my kick, but have to be in position. And lucky for me, I was able to uh, find that extra lean at the end to go one, two, three, clock, clock, and clock. And as you know, that was the first time a family had gone one, two, three at an event. And I, I don't think anyone would have done again the same family in the same event to go one, two, three. That was, that was a beautiful moment and so impactful. Um, like you said, I, I it's never been replicated before. And I think that's a yeah. that's a moment in track and field that can never be forgotten for sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so uh, just a couple more. So of course you're, you know, you're talking about your sisters, but now you have a daughter and yes. she's really, you know, she's tearing up the track and she's making, you know, a lot of impact now. Um, can you talk about, um, you know, some of the things that your daughter is doing and also, um, what are some things that you teach her and instill in her as she navigates not only track and field, but also just college and growing up as a young adult? Well, Talitha is, is a special athlete. She started a lot later than I. I think I started running probably 10, 11, doing mm -hmm. some of the AAU meets. Um, she didn't really start running into high school. She, we went down to the AAU meets a couple of times, but she didn't really train. My father lived in Florida and he wasn't going to come to New Jersey. So at that time, Orlando had the AAUs. So we were like, okay, if she goes and runs down in Orlando, he will come see her run and he'll be part of, of that piece. So that's what we did. We would take her down to Disney to uh, go down to that meet and just for him, him to see her. But she was nowhere near what those girls were doing. She would make the finals, but you know, uh, uh, they were just so much better than her. They trained. And, uh, and so when she got into high school, 
she started liking it. She did everything except track. She uh, did equestrian, she did ice skating, she did soccer, she did basketball, everything except track and field. So her sophomore year, she was running cross country and she did like it. And I just threw her there because that's what I did. And then um, her godfather, I asked him to coach her because he was sprint based. And when she got into the sprint, she just liked it. She just excelled at the one, two, and the four. So that's where she's been. And as you know, the rest is kind of creating history with her winning the NCAA indoors, running 50.7, just missed making the finals at the Olympic trials. You know, she, uh, uh, she is just doing really well, navigating through everything and, 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 and keeping her own identity. And then she's a, an amazing uh, student as well. She's a 4.0 student down there. She's studying international studies and, uh, and political science, minor in, in Asian studies. She have a, a first degree in three years. She graduated in May with one of her degrees and she still has another year of school for the other degree. So she's doing really well. She's at a 4.0 all four semesters so far. So she's competing at a high level athletically and academically. I tell her to be humble. I tell her not to um, uh, discredit her training and who she is. And, and I tell her that, you know, if you, go, if, you, you know, if you do your best that you can do. And sometimes your best is gonna fall short and you're not gonna win something. But what is the lesson that you're learning out of that? So that's what I try and give her. And to embrace the legacy, legacy of the family. She said today, we had an interview today and they asked her a question. She said, no, there's no pressure. I was born into that. So it's like being born with the weight on your chest. You don't know that is a weight there until you look around, no one else has it. And you go, oh, why don't they have that? So she said, I don't realize that that's there. That's just my, that's just my life. My grandfather, my mother, my aunts, my uncles, my family. That's just my situation. So I told her to embrace that. And, uh, you know, people ask, will she run the 800? Well, every time we talk about running the 800, she runs faster at the two and the four. So <laughs> there's no reason for her to go up yet, you know, at this time. So she's enjoying that. She's excelling uh, at that and she's having fun. Nice. And on that last point is super important, right? She's she's having fun, right? She's enjoying yeah. it. Um, and along the way, she's being extremely successful both on the yeah. track and off the track in her academics. So that yeah. is that is beautiful to, to hear. Um, so just uh, one last question before I, I just have some closing questions as well. But just in your post-track career, um, you've done so much and you've been engaged in various different initiatives and programs. Um, so can you talk about some of the things that you've done um, in your post-track career and what you've been involved in? Well, so one of my favorite things is uh, my track and field camp. This year, 2022, will mark my 21st annual track and field camp. And it's a really grassroots track and field camp. We get amazing sponsors. We keep it really affordable. My Olympian friends come out. And actually, we've had amazing people come through our camp, from Sydney McLaughlin to my daughter to Portia Dobson, who's now a coach over at uh, Dartmouth, um, uh, Anand uh, Bridget, who's long jumping over at Rutgers. Um, we've had such a, a guy named Tony who's over high jumping seven feet one now. Um, you know, we've had amazing kids come through the program, but even though if they didn't excel athletically, I've got some of my campus are now getting their PhDs over at Yale in neuroscience. Um, we have had uh, people who are uh, attorneys now. I have had one of my campus name their child after me, their middle name after me. So those are things that bring me joy, seeing that I had a grassroots program, a camp, a track and field camp, and we learn at the camp. We have education at the camp. The camp is mixed, boys and girls, all nationalities. It's just an amazing thing. So that's one thing. Then I do my motivational speaking. I am a leading authority with mental health, motivation, achievement, and I enjoy traveling with colleges and corporations, talking about empowerment, diversity, and inclusion, uh, women in sports, women in business. Uh, that's what I do, and I, I do a great job at that because I'm passionate about that as well. And then I do, I have a, a scholarship called Joy to Geniuses. We've given over $100,000 worth of money to students to go to college. So that's really cool to be able to have raised the money to, to have that happen. And last but not least, I have my product line called Joetta. It's a, a perfume, a body splash, and a lotion. 
And it is just something that is truly exciting. People often said, uh, I want to be like you. Well, you can't be like me, but guess what? If you put some Joetta on you, you can feel like me for that moment. So that's what we say, uh, Joetta for the champion in you. And um, I'm really excited about that. And then we have the, uh, the Joetta Fitness. That's the fitness part, the fitness component where we talk about being able to do a, a workout for 15, 20 minutes and keep it moving. A lot of us don't have two and three hours, especially now that everyone's back at work to go work out at a gym, but, the, but our programs are meant to meet you where you are with your fitness level. So uh, anyone that wants to be part of that, they can uh, you know, subscribe or look us up and that's J-O-T-Y-M-E fitness. And if you want to find me, just type in Joanna and everything comes up. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll be sure to, to share that so everyone could, um, can get involved. And I, I love kind of bringing it full circle where, you know, you were growing up, um, you didn't have as many opportunities, Title IX came along, um, but now you're giving back to, you know, the community in various different ways. So I am, you know, trying to empower and give opportunities to, to many girls and women, which is wonderful to hear. So I, I do appreciate that. Well, I, I always say that uh, I didn't get the gold medal in the Olympics, but I got the gold medal of life. I got a college education for free. I traveled around the world for free, had the opportunity to use my platform to help other people. And more, most importantly, I'm able to see my daughter navigate through a world that was quite different than mine and being able to offer just a little bit of advice from time to time. Beautiful, beautiful. So just last two questions and they're a sure. little, little bit different. Um, okay. But so first question is just, if you had the chance to compete um, in an upcoming Olympics, um, and let's say you're in your prime, you're healthy, you know, no injuries, but mm -hmm. you cannot compete in your primary event. So no 800, oh. what event would you choose? And it could be on the field, could be on the track. Mm. Well, if I wanted, am, am I going to be competitive in the event or just do it? You'll be competitive, you'll be competitive. Uh. I would do the, I would do the 400 meter hurdles. Oh, 400 yeah. meter hurdles. Yeah, I, I ran 57, like three or four um, back when the American record was held by a girl named Lori um, Edwards uh, was her last name at 56 high. And then Natalia Sheffield came by and ran 56 a little bit low. So at that time I was trying to get the American record but I was training on the cinder track. And when I fell on the cinders, that was a wrap. So I think the 400 meter hurdles would be an event that I would, would go after. Ooh, that would be beautiful. The the hurdle event is very competitive now with, um, you know, yeah. like Sydney McLaughlin, right? Came through your camp. Yeah, yeah, you have, you have, you have, you have a nice group of older ones and they're still young, but they've been around, but then you have the couple of younger ones coming up too. You say, you know, Sydney and, uh, and uh, Muhammad and those guys yeah, and, and, uh, are, 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 are old, but they're not really old. But when you have the collegiate students behind them, that makes them older, but the re reality is Sydney and those guys are maybe a year or two off of the college age kids. And then with the college age kids now staying in school longer because of COVID and red shirt years and all that stuff, so you have kids in school that are 22 and 23 and even some at 24 because of the COVID and red shirt. And uh, quite frankly, I don't blame them if they can stay in school and finish undergrad and go get a grad degree and still have the eligibility left. There's nothing wrong with that. It's legal, that's legal. Yeah, uh, so last, question. yep, last question. Just um, yes. what music do you, um, are you listening to? Or maybe like a favorite artist mm -hmm. that you love to indulge? Jeez, my, I, I'm strictly like club. I like club music. So, um, so I'm dating myself. I like the club music. But if I had to go, if I'm driving somewhere, I had to listen to somebody. Uh, I have about four or five. I could throw some baby face in there. Tony Braxton, I would listen to some of her. I would always do some, some Luther some Whitney, I'm more of that group. But then I like, you know, I like cross music. So I put some a Hall & Oates on, uh, James Taylor, you know, um, you know, Al, Al Jero kind of, you know, music, jazz type of music. So I, I kind of do a cross uh, a branch uh, of music there. And uh, some of the people that you, that you don't really think about all the time that you listen to, oh, I like that song. I'm not really a big rap person, like, I don't really know all the old, I, I know the older rappers, but I don't really have that on my, my Rolodex. 
Got it, got it. Well, that, that's beautiful. Some amazing, amazing artists there. Well, Joda, I really do appreciate you joining us for a conversation and sharing so much knowledge and so much inspiration and um, you know, continuing to do and give back to the community, both on the track, um, in the track and field community, and you know, of course, outside the community. It's wonderful yeah. speaking with you today. Pleasure has been mine. Good luck to you. And I, I can't wait to see you up close and personal. I guess you'll be at USA's. I don't know how you travel. Yeah, uh, possibly USA's and then uh, likely Worlds if you okay. if you happen to be there. Yep. Yep. If my daughter's there, I'll be there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.